Good evening. Here we are talking about alkenes and the addition reactions to alkenes. We've already done the E1 and E2 reactions of how to form an alkene in the last section. So here we have some common addition reactions to an alkene where, depending on what we need to add, we can use different reagents. We can do the hydrohalogenation. We can do, so hydrohalogenation, we add a hydrogen and a halogen t across the double bond. If we do a hydration, <coughs> pardon me, we add a hydrogen and an alcohol across the, the double bond. If we do a hydrogenation, we add a hydrogen on each end of the double bond. If we do a halogenation, we add a halogen on each end of the double bond. A halohydrin is a, a halogen and an alcohol on each end of the double bond. Or we can do a dihydroxylation where we put an OH on each end of the double bond. It depends on what we need to do, what we can do with this. So many different reactions are observed with alkenes. And basically it comes down to the pi bond is a nucleophile. So the pi bond can go and attack the least electronegative atom of the whatever we're adding to it, kicking out the more electronegative atom, which when we do that, as we said earlier in class, back on the, in the first test, the more stable the cation is, the more substituted it is. So we're going to get the most stable cation we can when the pi bond attacks the, the less electronegative atom. So that puts the hydrogen on the less substituted carbon in this example with HBr, and the bromide then could add to the more substituted carbon in the next step of the mechanism. The alkene is acting as a base slash nucleophile in the first step, and this process will be used over and over throughout the next couple of chapters. So in this, we have the addition versus an elimination a thermodynamic perspective and in this at low temperature we can do the addition of HX across the double bond or at high temperature we can do the elimination of HX to form the double bond so it just depends on which way we need to go and what all we can do so in this reaction one pi bond is broken one sigma bond is broken and two sigma bonds are formed in the reaction. Sorry, sigma bonds are formed. So in this, the regioselectivity of the, the reaction is where, in the first example here, we have a symmetrical alkene. So it doesn't matter how we do it. The pi bond attacks the hydrogen. We form a cation. And then the bromide adds to that cation to give us the product of the reaction. In the next one, it's not symmetrical, so we have two choices. We can have the pi bond attack the hydrogen, and we can form either of these two cations. And like we said on the previous page, we always want to form the most stable cation, so the secondary one is not going to form at all. All we're going to get is the primary or the tertiary one, and then Br minus can add to that tertiary cation to form the the bromine, adding to the more substituted carbon. Okay, now in this reaction. Or in this chapter, there's the what's known as Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov additions. And a lot of people talk about that and push that in the, the class. But really, if you understand the mechanism, whether it's Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, it does not matter if you understand what's going on in the mechanism. You can figure out which one it is. If you memorize all of it and you get flustered on the test, there's no way to recover from that. Okay, so while Vladimir Markovnikov did a lot of great work, just memorizing it's Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov won't get us anywhere. 
So here's the basic mechanism again, and I won't use Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. I'll just talk about the, the dead Russian rule, which is the alkene acts as a nucleophile. The alkene attacks the least electronegative hydrogen or atom. It goes to the less substituted carbon of the double bond, and then the more electronegative atom, in this case the bromide, will add to the more substituted carbon to give us this, where the less electronegative atom added to the less substituted carbon of the pi bond. Then, after that happens, the more electronegative atom attacks the more substituted carbon. Okay, and this will happen in every reaction we do throughout the this section, the more the less electronegative atom adds to the less substituted carbon, and then the more electronegative atom will attack the more substituted carbon of the initial pi bond. And it doesn't matter if it's a double bond or a triple bond, they all do the same sort of thing. And it's all about this, the stability of cation, okay, because we know the more substituted cation is more stable, so the less electronegative atom is always going to add to the less substituted carbon, it doesn't matter what the atom is, okay, so we have two things that we can do with hydrobromic acid, okay, we can do the, the reaction that we have just shown where the pi bond attacks the, the less electronegative atom form the more stable cation, and then the bromide adds to it to add the more electronegative atom to the more substituted carbon. Okay, With just HBr, it, that will always happen. There's nothing else that can occur. Okay, Now in the second one, we've talked about this before, when we have ROR peroxide or something else where we can do a free radical initiation, the mechanism is going to be completely different. It is not an anion, cation type mechanism with nucleophiles and electrophiles. It is a free radical process. So in this, we have our initiation where the ROOR splits apart into two RO radicals. Okay. Then we have the propagation where the RO radical will abstract an H hydrogen radical off of HBr to form ROH plus Br radical. Okay, That Br radical can now react with the alkene to form the most stable radical possible, which, remember, radicals are just like cations in that the the more substituted it is, the more stable it is, because a radical is an electron-poor species. Then we form that radical, and then that can abstract a hydrogen off of HBr. To form our final product, and then we can terminate the reaction with any two radicals coming together. It doesn't matter what you want to show, two bromine-free radicals or what. Oh, that gives us Br2. Okay. But it could be any of the any two free radicals that you've showed in the reaction could come together in the termination and terminate the reaction. Okay. So here's that mechanism drawn again, neatly drawn where we have the initiation, where we form the free radical. We have the free radical, the RO, plucking the hydrogen off of HBr to give us a new free radical of a Br radical. 
that can then go add to the alkene to form a new free radical in an initiation step, or in a propagation step, excuse me, and then that can grab a hydrogen to give us our final answer because we know that in a free radical reaction, we need to show the formation of all of our products in the, the process. Okay. And the, the main one we need to show is just the, the al alkyl bromide and then terminate it with two bromines coming together. Or it could be two of the cyclohexyl free radicals, two of the RO radicals, it doesn't matter, or some combination. Okay. So here's the mechanism again for the addition of HBr to an alkene. The pi bond acts as a nucleophile. It grabs the hydrogen, kicks off the bromine, giving us the tertiary radical or the tertiary cation, and then the Br anion, the bromide, can add to that to give us our final answer. And in this, every time the pi bond attacks the least electronegative atom, it goes to the least substituted carbon, and then the more electronegative atom adds to the more substituted carbon. Now in this, we have said we form the cation in this. Okay? So that cation, whatever cation it is, in the previous example, we formed this cation, and that carbon, let's do that with a different color, pardon me, that carbon that has the positive charge on it is sp2 hybridized and with that we know it is trigonal planar and that trigonal planar has 120 degree roughly bond angle between the three things around it so the nucleophile can add from either the top or the bottom, and it will add from either side at equal amounts, okay? So we don't get any stereocenter in this. We're going to get a racemic mixture if there were a carbon that had four different things on it. So if we don't form the most stable cation we can in the beginning, if we started with this, 3-methyl, 1-pentene, and added HBr to it, the first thing that happens is the pi bond goes and grabs a hydrogen, putting it on the less substituted carbon, forming that secondary cation. That secondary cation, we can have a hydrogen rearranged to form a tertiary cation, and then the bromide could add to that, and we would get this, where we have the 3-bromo-3-methyl pentane. Because... In the mechanism, we form the secondary cation, and the secondary cation isn't as stable as a tertiary cation, so it easily rearranges. Okay, that will always happen. It will always re rearrange. Okay, if we have an acid-catalyzed hydration, it's one step longer because the pi bond attacks the hydrogen, the less electronegative atom in solution, kicking out the water as a leaving group. The water then can add to the cation to form the protonated alcohol we have here, and then another water will come in and remove a hydrogen off of, that's a poorly drawn arrow there, remove a hydrogen off, the extra hydrogen off of it to give us our alcohol in the end. Okay, so there's an extra step in this mechanism because we add water as our nucleophile, the water is neutral, so once it adds in, it has a positive charge on the oxygen, and we have to take an extra hydrogen off to get to the neutral alcohol. Okay. The next one we can do is the oxymercuration demercuration. Okay. And in this, when we look at our reagents that we're starting with, the mercury acetate in the water, the least electronegative atom is the mercury, the nasty heavy metal. Okay, so it's gonna end up on the less substituted carbon with the more electronegative atom, the oxygen, adding to the more substituted carbon. So that gets us this as our intermediate, and we'll draw the mechanism in just a little bit. And then we can reduce off with sodium borohydride. 
Then we can reduce off with the sodium borohydride, and we all know why its name is hydride. The hydrogens react as if they have an H minus, so they reduce off the mercury, replacing it with a hydrogen. So in this overall reaction, the less electronegative hydrogen ends up adding across the pi bond with the oxygen going on the more substituted carbon of that. So in this mechanism, which we talked our way through the quick way on the previous slide, the pi bond attacks the mercury. When it attacks the mercury, the mercury loses an acetate, and the mercury having all of the, the extra orbitals on it, the orbitals and all, it can add to the more substituted car side of the pi bond to make a, a three-membered ring with a partial or full bond between the carbon and the mercury, spreading out the positive charge between both of them. Then the oxygen of the water can add in, break that bond, whether it's a partial bond or a full bond, and that gives us an OH2 plus on there and the mercury acetate on the less substituted side. And then another acetate, or the acetate, can come in, removing the extra hydrogen off of that oxygen to give us this intermediate where we have the mercury and the OH on there after the first step. And then we add the sodium borohydride, and all the sodium borohydride does is replace the mercury with a hydrogen, so we get it. We've basically added water across the pi bond in exactly the same fashion as if we just used H3O+. Plus. Okay. However, with this reaction, we don't have to worry about rearrangement occurring. So if the pi bond is not next to the most substituted carbon, a tertiary one, and we do the mercury acetate, we end up just adding water across the, the original pi bond with no change in the overall skeleton, carbon skeleton. Okay, And it doesn't matter what it is, we're going to just add, in the first step, the mercury acetate and the water across the pi bond. And then, in the second step, we would replace the mercury acetate with the hydrogen. So, but in this, since we never, on the previous page, showed the formation of a carbocation, we don't have to worry about this rearrangement occurring. Because we don't have that full cation on that carbon. So it's not going to rearrange because it's stabilized from the, having that partial bond of the mercury. Okay, the next reaction is the hydroboration oxidation. And in that, when we think about BH3, we can think about the order of electronegativity for outdoor clam bakes, never bring canned salmon, ham, or pancakes. Now it's in the syllabus, we talk about it once a week at least. But in that, we talk about hydrogen, ham, but we never say anything that's boron. So the boron is less electronegative than the hydrogen. So in the mechanism, the pi bond's going to attack the boron. But in this, as it attacks the boron, the hydrogen gets transferred over to the more substituted side at the same time because we can't kick out an H-. minus. We know... Hydrogen's not a good leaving group, so it has to be used as it transfers. So we added the hydrogen and the boron at the same time, so they add to the same side. So we're going to get the addition of that H and boron to the same side. And then in the second step of the reaction, we replace the boron, oxidize it off with an alcohol, with with the hydrogen peroxide and hydroxide, okay? We won't draw the mechanism in this class. It's a rearrangement occurs in that. So you keep the stereochemistry of the 
what the carbon boron bond was for the oxygen. So that's the one thing we have to be most careful of in this, is keeping the stereochemistry the same. Catalytic hydrogenation, where we have platinum, palladium, or nickel as our catalyst, adds two hydrogens across the pi bond. Okay, so in this, the pi bond binds to the platinum, the palladium, the nickel, whatever, it doesn't matter. The hydrogen gas binds to it also, and then we basically transfer the platinum or the palladium out of the way and just transfer the hydrogens over to the, the carbon. So they add to the same side. We're going to get both enantiomers. We're not going to get just one of them. They're, we'll get, if there is an enantiomer, we'll get both of them if, there's a, if it forms a stereocenter. Okay, there's, we don't just get one of them because it adds to both faces of the pi bond because both of the carbons here, remember, are sp2 hybridized. They're trigonal planar. Okay, we don't have any... We don't have to... With, with it being planar, it's going to add from either side, the top or the bottom, and it'll always add from either side. There's nothing we can do about it. doesn't... Does it keep going side or the other from happening. Okay, the last mechanism, the halogenation or halohydrin formation, they both do roughly the same thing. We have the four possible mechanisms here. Okay, and in this, we know that in the addition of the halogens, the bromines add anti to one another across the the pi bond. So in this, since they add an anti, we know it can't be mechanism one because they're both a sin and anti addition. That doesn't happen. Okay. In mechanism two, we get only sin addition, so it can't be that one. In mechanism three, we get only the anti addition, so that is possible. And in mechanism four, we add the bromine, forming the cation, which we could have rotate around, or we could form the three-membered ring and then open it up. But if we went through this intermediate right here, we could have rotation around this bond. So really, we could get some of the anti and some of the sin. There wouldn't be any control over it. Okay, So the only one that can work is mechanism three, where the pi bond attacks the bromine. And as it attacks the bromine, the bromide leaves. And then the bromine also has another pair of electrons. So we get the bromonium ion. And then the nucleophile, the bromide, can add from the backside, opening it up. So in this... If we wanted to show the mechanism, the pi bond attacks the bromine, the bromine adds to the more substituted side, and we kick out the bromide. So we end up with the methyl, if we want to be consistent, the methyl is going back, the bromonium ion is coming towards us and then in the second case second step the bromide minus comes in and adds to the more substituted side from the back side of the bromonium ion flipping it forward giving us this stereocenter okay so it's the addition of the anti-addition of the bromines across the pi bond. Okay, and it always adds them anti to one another. In the next one, we're going to have the same thing happen at first where we attack a bromine, kick one out, the bromine that we attacked adds in to form 
the bromonium ion again. Anytime we have a halogen, we're going to form the bromonium ion. And then our nucleophile is not the Br minus, it's water because we have a, a lot of it around. It's the solvent. So we add it in, it adds from the back side. This bromine of the bromonium ion stays put. The other one ends up methyl coming forward words with the OH2 plus going back and then we remove our extra hydrogen off of it and we have the halohydrin. Okay, for the dihydroxylation there are actually four dihydroxylation reactions that we can do. The first two are the anti-dihydroxylation where we end up putting the OHs on opposite sides of the, the double bond. And in this, the first thing that happens is we react it with a per acid. We all remember what a per acid is from what we learned in Gen Chem. Okay, the per implies an added oxygen in there. So a regular carboxylic acid just has the two oxygens. A per carboxylic acid has an extra one in there and the pi bond can attack it, kicking out the leaving group, sending the electrons over towards the carbonyl, which then go grab the hydrogen and it can go send the electrons to the more substituted side to give us the three-membered ring, the epoxide. And then we can open that epoxide up with either acid or base, where if we add acid to it, we protonate the three-membered ring and our nucleophile adds to the more substituted side of the epoxide. In the hydroxide addition, the hydroxide adds to the less substituted side because of how the, the reaction occurs via SN2 type. So in this mechanism, when we drew the first step previously, but the pi bond grabs the, the oxygen off of the per acid, we send the electrons around in the per acid to kick off the, the, a, new, a different acid. And then as we break this bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, the electrons go to form the three-membered ring. So we get the epoxide and we get some carboxylic acid, the same basic carbon skeleton as what we had initially for our per acid. We've just lost one of the oxygens out of it. Now there's two mechanisms that we can go about opening up the epoxide. We can add a hydroxide, a strong base. It undergoes an SN2 type mechanism where in an SN2 the nucleophile adds to the less substituted carbon have direct displacement, and then once we've opened up the epoxide, we can protonate the, the O minus, and we get the anti-dihydroxylation with the nucleophile adding to the less substituted carbon of the pi bond. If we have acid or acidic water and we add um, to a peroxide or an epoxide, we have the oxygen goes, grabs the hydrogen off of the acidic water to give us the protonated epoxide. Then to that, the water can add to it, kicking out our OH+. Now in this, it adds to the more substituted carbon. It adds to the carbon that would form the most stable cation. We don't form a cation in it but it adds to the carbon that would form the most stable cation. And then our extra water comes in and grabs the extra hydrogen to give us the, the anti-diol, which is the addition of the oxygens on opposite sides based on what happened in the base catalyzed mechanism. The other one we can do is the syn dihydroxylation. And in that, we can use either osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate, and the basic mechanism is the same in both. We have the pi bond grabs an oxygen, send the electrons down to the, the metal, 
And then as it does that, one of the oxygens breaks a bond forming a five-membered ring with the metal. And then we can cleave off the metal with base or an oxidant to give us the syn dihydroxylation. Now in this, the only part of the mechanism you really have to worry about is this first part where we add both oxygens at the same time. And doing that, since they add at the same time, they need to be on the same side. So that gives us the syn dihydroxylation. Okay, we can also cleave a double bond and in that ozone O3 we take a carbon carbon double bond and we cleave it if we have either dimethyl sulfide or zinc and water we get the ketone and aldehyde out of the reaction because zinc and water are, or dimethyl sulfide are reducing agents, so that gives us the aldehyde. If we have hydrogen peroxide, we get still get a ketone out of it if we had a carbon off of the, the alkene in a starting material, but if we have a hydrogen on it, we get a carboxylic acid out of it. So hydrogen peroxide after the ozonolysis gives us ketones and acids out of the reaction. So we have the possibility of either one forming, depending on what kind of workup we do, whether it's the dimethyl sulfide or the hydrogen peroxide.